earth, that pale blue dot suspended in a sunbeam. Earth is, as far as we know, the only place in the cosmos that harbors life. Alone in the vast reaches of the universe, life on Earth struggles to survive and perpetuate itself across the eons of time. But what is it about Earth that makes it such an ideal place for life? And what kind of life emerged here, on this humble planet, tucked away in the quiet suburbs of the galaxy? The most all-encompassing trait of the planet Earth that makes it so fertile for life is its climate. The Earth has a temperature and a pressure that allows for liquid water to exist on the surface. The climate is stable, so liquid water can be stable too, and it's been sustained on the surface of the Earth for more than 4 billion years. Water can exist in all three phases here on Earth. It can be a gaseous vapor in the atmosphere, it can fall from the sky in the form of snow, or in the form of rain to make lakes and rivers, which then feed into the oceans. This liquid water has served as the basis for all life that has since emerged and perpetuated itself on the planet. Early in the Earth's life, its magnetic field stabilized and protected the atmosphere from being stripped away in the solar wind. Its hot, magma-laden crust began to cool and solidify, eventually forming tectonic plates that float on top of the mantle. Dry land masses emerged, Ocean temperatures cooled and stabilized, and slowly, ever so slowly, prebiotic chemistry began to evolve into biotic chemistry, which then evolved into biology itself. More than four billion years ago, when the Earth was still extremely young and volatile, the first self-replicating molecules emerged. And after about half a billion years of gradual cooling, these self-replicating molecules coalesced, and through chemical evolution, they generated the first true life forms, the first tiny primitive cells that would eventually become the ancestors to all life on Earth. These first cells represent one of the biggest mysteries of earthly biology. We have a lot of clues and a lot of experimental data that points to plausible routes through which our biochemistry could have emerged, but we don't quite know exactly how it happened. We do have several well-informed hypotheses that give big-picture descriptions, like the RNA world hypothesis, which posits that RNA, being a simpler nucleic acid, was generated before DNA. The hypothesis argues that RNA was the first molecule capable of catalyzing its own reproduction, but it suffered from being relatively unstable. It was a little too reactive. DNA evolved as a more stable structure that chemically evolved out of the RNA, perhaps coming about when an RNA molecule attempted replication, but the newly synthesized strand didn't release. Instead, it just stayed bound to the original parent strand, forming the double-stranded helix. This is just one possible way that DNA could have evolved from RNA. Another well-supported hypothesis argues that the first life forms were probably methanogens, that emerged in the mineral substrate lining the inside of deep-sea hydrothermal vents, where they would have had access to thermal and chemical energy. Keep in mind that the hydrothermal vent hypothesis and the RNA world hypothesis describe different levels of chemical and biological evolution, and they aren't in conflict or contradiction with each other. Both the RNA world and the hydrothermal vent hypothesis can be, and quite likely are, true. However it happened, the Earth became a life-bearing world. This life evolved in response to the stresses and pressures of its earthly environment. Some of the evolutionary pressures were physical phenomena, like asteroid impacts or ambient temperatures, while other pressures were biological, being induced by the life forms themselves. For example, one of the earliest achievements of evolution was a stable mechanism for photosynthesis, which consumes carbon dioxide and sunlight to produce sugars and molecular oxygen. Photosynthetic microbes, like cyanobacteria, began exhaling molecular oxygen into the atmosphere. At first, this oxygen was absorbed by oxygen sinks, like iron deposits, decaying organic matter, and the ocean itself. But when the sinks became saturated, oxygen began to accumulate in the atmosphere. It reached such a concentration that it led to an event called the Oxygen Crisis, or the Oxygen Holocaust. 
This refers to the fate of the dominant life forms of the time, the obligate anaerobic methanogen microbes, who are most likely poisoned and killed by the high oxygen concentration. Additionally, the oxygen would have decomposed methane in the atmosphere, and since methane is a greenhouse gas, its reduction would have caused the planet to cool down. Thus, the oxygen holocaust is also linked to a long period of extreme glaciation, called the Huronian glaciation, where the planet was probably covered almost entirely in snow and ice. This period in the history of Earth life is defined by its first mass extinction event. But where there is death, there is also life. Some of the oxygen in the atmosphere formed ozone, which absorbs UV radiation from the sun, and thus protects the surface of the Earth from being sterilized, like the soil on Mars or the Moon. Oxygen is also critical to modern biology itself, as it's used as a final electron acceptor at the end of the phosphorylation cascade in cellular respiration. An interesting fact is that because oxygen is so reactive, it usually gets combined really quickly into other compounds and materials. If there was aliens and they looked at Earth and detected a large quantity of free oxygen, this might get them a little excited. They would figure that something must be producing and replenishing that oxygen continually, otherwise it would all eventually be gone. In other words, the free oxygen in our atmosphere is a clue to any potential watching aliens that there just might possibly be life here on this planet. I mean, free oxygen can be created through totally physical, uh, geological processes, but it can also be synthesized by life. And so it's, it's a pretty exciting signal, or a pretty exciting clue, that uh, there might be life forms on the planet you're looking at. Anyways, the high oxygen concentration enabled life to evolve an optimized form of aerobic respiration, and this had huge consequences. The bacterial ancestors of mitochondria would eventually form a symbiosis with larger archaeal cells, and feed them energy in return for nutrients and protection. This gave rise to a third branch of Earth life, distinct from either archaea or bacteria, and this third branch was called the eukaryotes. The mitochondrial bacterium, now symbiotically embedded in the archaeal cell to form a, a primitive eukaryotic cell, could produce way more energy than the original archaeal cell was used to, and around 1.5 billion years ago, this excess of available energy led to the evolution of multicellularity, or conglomerations of cells that were physiologically and morphologically integrated into a single whole, a greater totality called an organism. The organism is composed of cells, and the cells specialize to form particular tissues and organs that allow the organism to stay alive and reproduce. After nearly three billion years of asexual reproduction, some of these multicellular organisms evolved the capacity to reproduce sexually, which would have vastly increased their genetic diversity. In turn, this would vastly improve their evolutionary flexibility, their ability to adapt to stressors and diversify. Once the life on Earth had evolved multicellularity and sexual reproduction, the cascade of divergence and speciation really started to take off. Some of these photosynthetic microbes evolved into filamentous algaes, and these algaes, growing along the sides of lakes and gentle tide pools, would give rise to the plants. The plants evolved to creep across the dry surface of the planet, photosynthesizing sunlight while breathing in CO2 and breathing out molecular oxygen. Fungi migrated out of the ocean and onto dry land even earlier than the plants did, and the spread of fungus led to a subsequent erosion of the mineral bedrock, and this began the genesis of the first soils. This is an example of the way that fungi have fundamentally altered the world to make it more hospitable for other forms of life, and this is as true today as it was 600 million years ago. The fungi are dynamic masses of hyphaeal filaments that grow and spread towards food and recede away from areas without food. Fungi are an extremely important part of Earth's ecology, as they perform critical roles that support the ecosystem as a whole, and they also do stuff that benefits specific species and genera in their community. For example, fungi feed all manner of animals, from insects to burrowing vertebrates. 
Fungi also forms a variety of symbiotic relationships with plants. Some fungus integrates itself into the plant's roots and enhances its water-absorbing capacity by orders of magnitude. Other fungus has integrated with algae to create lichens, which can live in almost every biome that the Earth has to offer. The animals are the most dynamic of the Earth's life. Although many of the branches of Kingdom Animalia are worms and worm-like creatures, other branches have evolved remarkable size, complexity, and morphological diversity. The animals are essentially mobilized food tubes. Their bodies possess mouths that intake food on one end and anuses on the other end where waste is excreted. This main body structure has limbs protruding from it, which allows the animal to move around and interact with its environment. On the front end of the animal's body, there's also a bunch of protruding sensoria apparatuses, like eyes and ears and tongues, that help the animal sense the world around it. The animals on Earth are hugely diverse, including everything from the soft-bodied cephalopods and tiny tropical frogs to scaly reptiles and large boreal mammals. A key evolutionary development for animal life was the spinal cord, which runs down the length of the animal's core body. A skull was evolved to protect the brain, and the vertebrates officially emerged when protective rings of bone developed around the spinal cord. This armored spinal cord running down the length of a bilateral body structure is an immensely powerful biological platform. Innervated limbs can adapt to any environment, like the lobed fins of the fish who would give rise to the first tetrapods, which would give rise to the first amphibians, which would give rise to the reptiles, specifically to the archosaurs, which would then give rise to the birds. Through this evolutionary lineage, we can see the malleable forelimb transition from a lobed fin to a webbed foot to a scaly claw to a feathered wing. In its long and storied history, the life on Earth has survived many mass extinction events, but five of them stand out as being exceptionally large and destructive. Keep in mind that all of these major extinction events happened after the Cambrian Explosion. Life existed on Earth for 3.5 billion years before the Cambrian Explosion, and for about half of that time, life was little more than single-celled microbes. The oxygen holocaust, while it is considered a mass extinction, is not among the Big Five, or the five biggest mass extinction events in Earth's history. Each of these Big Five has drastically shaped the evolution of life on Earth, beginning with the Ordovician and Silurian extinction events that happened around 450 million years ago. This was a series of events wherein global climates cooled, and five pulses of glaciation lowered the sea level dramatically, which led to half of all marine animal genera going extinct. Earth life had less than 100 million years to recover before the next mass extinction hit in the late Devonian. It's not entirely confirmed what caused this second extinction event, but it's suspected to have been widespread ocean anoxia caused by undersea volcanoes. This event wiped out 50% of aquatic genera, much like the preceding mass extinction. Life on land, however, wasn't nearly as badly damaged. In fact, plant life thrived. The plant genus Archaeopteris had spread to a global distribution around this time, and the roots of all of these plants permeated the pores in the bedrock and fractured it, weathering it, and eroding it down into dust. This would have contributed minerals to the Earth's young soils, but heavy rainfall washed much of it into the oceans, where it then fed algae. The resulting algal blooms would have consumed huge quantities of oxygen, creating the aforementioned widespread ocean anoxia that wiped out half of the marine genera. The actual cause of this second giant mass extinction event was probably a combination of undersea volcanoes and the successive sediment deposition into the ocean which would have fed these algal blooms. Both of those things would have led to widespread ocean anoxia, which would have suffocated a lot of the marine life, and that's precisely what it looks like happened. The third mass extinction came about 252 million years ago, and it was so intense, it makes the first two major mass extinctions look like hiccups. 
It's believed that around this time, extreme volcanic activity was geologically reshaping central Siberia. There was so much volcanism in this region that we know today as the Siberian Traps that it basically ignited the northern half of the tectonic plate called Asia. The volcanoes pumped CO2 and sulfur compounds into the air, and they washed magma and pyroclastic flow across the surface, which presumably started burning any nearby coal, natural gas, and surface vegetation. All of this CO2 raised the temperature of the Earth until the methane clathrates buried deep in the ocean floor began to dissolve, and all of that methane was released into the atmosphere. It was essentially a Permian-era rendition of the clathrate gun hypothesis, and it wiped out more than 80% of all genera on the planet. 70% of terrestrial vertebrates were gone. 96% of all marine life was gone. The end Permian extinction 252 million years ago was a scourge upon the Earth that absolutely savaged the biosphere. Genetic variety was greatly reduced, and the ecological recovery took many millions of years longer than it did for any preceding mass extinction event. But despite the intensity of this destruction, life did indeed eventually recover. This led to the period in the Earth's history where the dinosaurs came to dominate, as they enjoyed the residual heat from whatever caused the Permian-Triassic extinction. But barely more than 50 million years had passed before the fourth major extinction event came and hit the Earth. This Triassic-Jurassic extinction event, occurring around 201 million years ago, sent about a third of aquatic species into extinction, as well as many of the early archosaurs, many of the large amphibians, and many of the remaining large mammals. This event is what stripped the lineages of proto-mammals down to mostly rodent-like creatures burrowing in the underbrush. If these burrowing, rodent-like creatures were extinguished, if they were driven extinct by this intense event, well, we wouldn't be here today. There'd be no humans. There'd be no rodents, no primates, no ungulates, no mammals at all. It would be a very different world. Now, after this fourth mass extinction event, the Earth went through a 135 million year long period with remarkably few interruptions and mass extinctions, and those that did occur were minor and localized. This is truly the age of the dinosaurs, and the world saw the wild diversification of dinosaurs and their cousin lineages, like the pterosaurs. Flowering plants emerged, and these too underwent massive diversification and speciation, and they spread across the planet eventually replacing conifers as the dominant tree species in the 40 million years or so before the KT extinction. Insects also diversified, especially in response to the angiosperms, where they formed a critically important pollinator symbiosis. This insect-flower symbiosis is one of the things that sustains angiosperm life across the planet today. So this 135 million year long period went on and on, and life grew and thrived and diversified, and it was all splendid and beautiful and wonderful. But around 66 million years ago, a massive meteor strike brought this era to an end. As I mentioned earlier, the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event, also called the Cretaceous Tertiary or the KT extinction, blanketed the earth in ash and dust, and briefly flared up the heat to oven-like temperatures. The death and carnage was so destructive that virtually 75% of all life on Earth was destroyed. Almost no four-legged animals heavier than 25 kilograms, or about 55 pounds, were able to survive. The dinosaurs, the larger mammals, the pterosaurs, they were all wiped out. Marine life was also shattered, as genera of fish, mollusk, and plankton took heavy hits. But again, after such a devastating mass extinction, the greater totality of life survived and rebounded, diversifying to fill in the ecological niches left open by those organisms that had perished. It was after this event that the Earth saw a diversification of birds and fish, but mostly a diversification among mammals, which produced horses and other ungulates, as well as some lineages that returned to the sea, like the whales and the dolphins. This post-KT extinction Earth also saw the emergence of primates. 
This early primate family had tarsiers and lemurs and monkeys, and from the monkeys arose the great apes. About six million years ago, a lineage of great apes diverged. One branch would go on to branch again, producing the two closely related species that we know today as the chimps and the bonobos. But that first divergence event, the, the earlier divergence event, also created the Homo genus, which would split into various branches like the Denisovans, the Neanderthals, and eventually the Homo sapiens sapiens. This particular branch of earthly primates are worth a deeper look. After all, you are one of them. These primates had big brains, and they evolved an extremely sophisticated sense of tool use. Where they began making tools by shaping rocks and sticks into pointy objects they could use to cut meat or hunt animals, they ended up creating nuclear weapons, particle accelerators, and spacecraft. These primates altered much of the Earth to suit their needs, and in their pursuit of natural resources, they ended up destroying many habitats and driving many species into extinction. Chemical refuse, industrial runoff, and pharmaceutical waste pollute the oceans, and everything has become saturated with microplastics. The primates began digging out coal and burning that to power engines, and then they found that natural gas and oil was a more effective thing to burn to power your engines, and so they started doing that too. And the whole time, they began pumping CO2 into the atmosphere that had been locked deep underground for millions of years. Today, the primate civilization is overburdening the Earth's biosphere, and it's now driving the sixth major mass extinction event. Consider this. For millions of years, the carbon content in the atmosphere has been decreasing. Plants have adapted to this decrease in carbon concentration, which has slowly made it more and more difficult for them to absorb CO2. If the CO2 concentration drops too far below 200 parts per million, it becomes increasingly difficult for plants to absorb the CO2 that they need to make sugars and to grow their tissues. Before we started burning fossil fuels, the atmospheric concentration of CO2 was around 220 parts per million. On an evolutionary timescale, plant life on Earth was in danger. But when that noteworthy primate began digging up and burning coal, oil, and natural gas, this took carbon that had been locked out of the carbon cycle for millions of years and pumped it back in. On an evolutionary timescale, it could be argued that the anthropogenic extinction saved the plants. It saved them from an earlier natural trend of increasing glaciation and decreasing CO2 concentration that would have eventually seen them all starve, which would have led to the total collapse of the Earth's biosphere. In this way, it could be argued that the human species emerged, built a globe-spanning civilization, and then overheated the Earth with CO2, killing themselves off in the process, but ultimately saving all life on Earth by sacrificing themselves to return carbon into the atmosphere. Obviously, this isn't intentional on our part, and we would really like it if we didn't drive ourselves to extinction. But this would be the silver lining, as perceived by a future civilization looking back across millions of years through time to study the origin of the sixth major mass extinction event on Earth. But increasing CO2 isn't a panacea for plants. It's not a silver bullet. CO2 is just one of many nutrients that plants need. And if CO2 is abundant, then the plant doesn't really have to worry about it. But the plant's growth will then be limited by some other critical nutrient, like nitrogen or phosphorus. Whatever nutrient is the least accessible to the plant in the necessary proportions, that will limit its growth. It's called the limiting nutrient because it's less available than every other nutrient. And so the plant's growth can only be as fast as it can uptake the rarest nutrient. There's also the fact that increased CO2 is increasing the ocean's acidity, and this chemical alteration will be catastrophically destructive as, as it messes with various biological and biomineral reactions. Creatures that can't stand the increasing concentration of carbonic acid will die, and creatures that need to use mineral salts to build shells will find themselves unable to adequately perform the reactions, and they'll die off too. These mass die-offs will have very few survivors, and those that do survive will be vulnerable to extinction for thousands 
if not millions of years, until the ecology recovers and the mark of human primate civilization fades away. If there is a future civilization on Earth after humans have gone extinct, I can only dream about what they'd be like. I can only dream about the flora and fauna that will live on the planet Earth in a million years' time, or ten, or a hundred million years into the future. I can only dream about what path life will take, and how the story of biology on Earth will unfold over the next half a billion years. At this point in the far future, the story of life on Earth will come to an end, as the sun will expand and roast the planet, boiling the oceans and eventually consuming the planet itself entirely in an expanding shell of plasma. After this happens, Titan will most likely be the most habitable place in the solar system, and the Earth will be gone, as well as all the life that ever lived upon its crust. Is this truly the end of life on Earth? Yes, it will be. Billions of years of evolution, and a near-infinite sea of genetic diversity, the product of a planet-spanning super-reaction, will eventually come to an end, and will exist no more. But this doesn't have to be the end. There's two possibilities that I can see that would save the legacy of Earth life from total destruction. First, and the much more likely possibility, is that the processes of panspermia might transplant Earth microbes onto Titan and perpetuate earthly biochemistry there. This is unlikely on its own, but it's way, way more likely than the second possibility. The second possibility is that some other intelligent species extracts samples of the life from Earth before it goes extinct, and preserves it in artificial off-planet habitats, or transplants it onto an entirely new Earth-like planet. It's possible that humans will be this intelligent species if we somehow quickly learn to create space habitats that can support us indefinitely. I mean, we might not have the political will to do it, but we do have the technological knowledge to build space habitats and preserve Earth life forms. Or at the very least, we can preserve their genetic code for later cloning. If our descendants want to transplant Earth life onto other planets, This will necessarily involve technology that allows us to travel between star systems. Such a future is a beautiful but distant dream. Now it's also possible that there are other sentient species and advanced civilizations out there in the galaxy. It's possible that some of these civilizations are older than the human species itself, and their technology would allow them to easily extract, preserve, and transplant Earth-based life onto other worlds. This would, of course, start a conversation about the political motives and the values of an extraterrestrial civilization, which is far enough away from the original topic of this video that I think it's time to wrap it up. This has been a look at the life on Earth, the most fertile planet in the solar system. 